Well, the importance for me is that it's a breakthrough. Uh, we, uh, it took till 2010 to get any reference at all to migration and population displacement in a UNFCCC document. So for me, that comes a bit late, but on the other hand, I'm delighted it's a real breakthrough if paragraph 10 remains within the draft document. That it gives us now basically an authority to refer to climate migration and to climate migrants uh, as such. And I think that will help us in dramatizing a little more the effect of climate change on population movements and forced displacement. Well, first of all, we have to do what we've been doing for the last 30 years. We have to continue publishing. We have to continue developing our data and evidence-based policy making so that people have the facts and figures and know the drama uh, that we're talking about. We have to continue to do pilot projects as we're doing now in Haiti, uh, Mauritius, uh, Kenya, and several other countries to try to test out uh, how well we can do in mitigating uh, uh, migration uh, effect, effects on, on migrants. I think from a very, a very parochial point of view, IOM would like to see a greater emphasis on adaptation. We're not doing enough to help countries that know they're in great difficulty on the climate change side to be able to adapt their people, get them ready before the fatal moment comes and we have to then get Asian in very costly mitigation. So there's a lot more that could be done there that's not being done now. You have climate change, but you also have other parts of what I call the perfect storm. You have more conflicts today uh, in the world than ever before in terms of simultaneous complex humanitarian emergencies from the western uh, part of Africa to the Himalayas, as I often say. We have more forced migration. We have bad governance in a lot of places that adds to the problem. We have abject poverty. We have the declining sort of socioeconomic disparities between global north and global south. All of that comes into the mix. And then if you add climate change on top of that, you have really a challenge for us. And, and I don't think that, generally speaking, our governments, particularly our parliaments, are well enough aware of what is happening and why they have a responsibility to address this in both monetary and, and policy terms. The majority of these people probably will qualify for some form of protection under the 1951 Geneva Convention, and that's all well and good, and we support that. On the other hand, you cannot lump everybody else in one basket called economic migrants. What do you have in that basket of people? You have many, many unaccompanied minors that have no papers at all, who have to be protected because they're, minor, they're minors. You have pregnant women, you have the sick and the elderly, you have victims of trafficking, you have people who are going to reunify with their family, perhaps in Scandinavia. They're not all, by any means, economic migrants. So we have to have special treatment for each of those categories. Now We have something called the SIDS, the Small Island Developing States, that meets on a regular basis, and uh, that has been able to galvanize some public opinion and some financial support for what's coming to these countries. Uh, but it's not alone going to be enough. And I think it has to be increasingly a focus on, on the adaptation strategy that would help countries well in advance of what's going to happen to adapt in some cases by sending their people to other countries, by doing some form of at least uh, uh, what you could call circular migration, seasonal visas, a much more dynamic and resourceful use of visa policy, for example, temporary protective status, whatever's required, but right now, the attention is not sufficiently focused on the SIDS and other countries facing uh, climate change.